So what triggers supervolcanoes? Supervolcanoes are very large volcanoes, much larger than anything we think of when we hear the word volcano. But before we go into the supervolcanoes like Yellowstone, I want to briefly explain to you about conventional volcanoes. With conventional volcanoes, I mean anything from Stromboli, which is very small, to things like Krakatau, Pinatubo, which are very large. But compared to supervolcanoes, all of these are extremely small. So conventional volcanoes. Um, and perhaps some of you have been to Stromboli in Italy. Um, it's a very nice island. You can go up there as an organized tour. You can watch eruptions every 15 minutes, every half an hour. They're very pretty. There's no real danger involved. Makes for a nice trip. You should definitely go there. <laughs> There's also Etna, which is close by, so you could even combine it in one holiday. <laughs> um, if you're lucky, there will be an eruption going on. You have lava flows that go down sometimes to the sea, but not very often. And even if they do, people get a fair warning. Maybe the houses are destroyed, but rarely people will die on Mount Etna. But it does make for pretty pictures. <laughs> However, it's, all not, it's not all fun and games, volcanic activity. This image is quite a gruesome image. It's from Pompeii, which got buried by volcanic ash from Mount Vesuvius in the Roman times. So what you see on the image are basically plaster casts. What happened was people were caught by surprise by the volcanic ash. They got buried by the ash. They died. Their bodies decayed over time and an empty space was left behind. So when the archaeologists came to Pompeii, they found these empty spaces. They filled them up with plaster and this is what emerged after they removed the ash. So this is really a testimony to the destructive power of volcanoes. Now this was 2,000 years ago, but also today there are real hazards associated with volcanoes. So every couple of decades, in the last few hundred years, there has been an eruption killing tens of thousands of people. Um, on a global scale, this is not the biggest natural disaster there is. They're certainly bigger, but for the local people around these volcanoes, this is a, these are true hazards. Um, you will see, you will note on this table that the cause of that can be very diverse. It's volcanoes that, that cause the casualties, but it can be mud flows. Sometimes the volcano melts a glacier and the melting water forms a mudslide which can bury a town like happened in Colombia. You can have tsunamis, you can have starvation. Now, the good or the bad thing, the, the bad thing for, for us, for people, is that these occur quite regularly. The good thing for volcanology as a science is that each time one occurs, we can learn something new about these eruptions. So each time a volcano occurs, we learn something new and this helps us to predict the next one. So there have been successes and failures in volcanology. This is definitely one of the failures. This was in 2008 in Chile. It's a huge plinear eruption, um, which caught everybody by surprise. Fortunately, this is in a very remote area, so there were no casualties. Um, but if this would happen in a more populated area, this would be a real catastrophe. I mean, even now there was disruption of airline traffic and things like that, but there were no casualties. There have also been successes, though. The previous one was not predicted, but in in the 90s, early 90s, Mount Pinatubo had a big eruption, and this eruption was predicted. So the volcanologists managed to alert the government in time, who initiated an evacuation, and tens of thousands of lives were saved. So with conventional volcanoes, they are a continuing hazard, and they need monitoring, but the science is progressing to the point that if we are looking, we can probably, most likely, sometimes predict them, sometimes not. But we are definitely on track. Then coming to the supervolcanoes, the story is very different. Um, fortunately, these occur very rarely, once every 100,000 years or less, so a few in a million years maybe. Because of that, we don't really know anything what's going on. We never seen one erupting. So we have to learn everything from the ash deposits and from knowing the physics of the process. The supervolcanoes actually got noticed quite late in, by the geological community because, because they are so big, basically. They are so big that they are hard to spot. If you're standing in Yellowstone Caldera, it's so large, you don't really see that you're in the middle of a big crater. Um, it's a nice, peaceful landscape. You don't really have the feeling that you're standing on a very, very large volcano. There are some signs, of course, that something is happening underneath. There are hydrothermal springs. Uh, there is geysers. There's some volcanic activity, but nothing to really show the size. To really appreciate the size of these supervolcanoes, you have to look from space. This is a satellite image of Toba Caldera. It's in Indonesia. There was a big eruption there 74,000 years ago, um, which basically left a big hole in the ground. The black you see on the picture is a lake. The lake is 90 kilometers long and 30 kilometers across. 
So there was a huge eruption of material, and after the eruption, everything collapsed back, and a huge hole was left. And in fact, this is a graph that shows the magma volume erupted by these volcanoes, by regular volcanoes and supervolcanoes. So very big eruptions, for example, Tambora in 1815, which caused a global year without summer, erupted 50 cubic kilometers. This is the biggest eruption where we have relatively good records. These supervolcanoes can erupt up to 100 times more. So the consequences would be much more severe. One consequence is ash. That's why we know these eruptions were so big. There's a lot of ash deposited tens to hundreds of meters close to the center, but also thousands of kilometers away, enough ash to prevent agriculture for at least one growing season. So if something would erupt in North America now, perhaps half of the continent would be unable to produce agricultural products for at least a year. This is a huge problem on a continental scale, but on a global scale, there would be much more severe consequences, um, especially with global cooling. So what is shown here is the solar radiation transmitted to the Earth's surface on Hawaii. Hawaii because it's in the middle of the Pacific and there's no other influences, so you get a clean signal. And you see a very constant transmittance of the solar radiation, except after these volcanic eruptions, for example, Pinatubo, where you get a decrease in the sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. Now, for Pinatubo, this led to a global cooling of about half a degree, which is no problem. We can deal with that. But to come back to this slide, Pinatubo erupted five cubic kilometers of material. So it could be up to a thousand times more. So climatologists have modeled and tried to estimate what the consequences would be. And depending on magma composition, you could lower the Earth's temperature globally for a decade by five to ten degrees. So that's basically a, a global collapse of agriculture. There's no way that agriculture can deal with this, and there's probably no way that we as a society, if one were to happen today, would be ready to deal with this consequence. We're talking mass starvation, millions, billions of people. Not the end of human species. I mean, I'm sure there would be people who survive locally, but civilization at this point would not be ready for something like this. Now, that being said, these are very rare events, so this is not something you have to worry about in your personal lives. Um, the, the chance that something will occur in our lifetime or our children's lifetime is very, very small. But when they do occur, they will be catastrophic. And something will occur in some point in the future. There's no reason if they're happening for millions of years why it would suddenly stop today. So that one will occur is, is certain. It's just, it's not something to worry about today, but it would be nice when one occurs that we are ready to at least predict it and perhaps mitigate it. So what triggers these supervolcanoes? As I said before, we don't really know much because there are about 40, 50 of these events identified in the geological record by the ash flows, but we don't know the details. If we think of any volcano, a supervolcano or a, or a normal conventional volcano, we have a magma chamber underneath, which is a volume of molten rock. Now, this rock can be fully molten or partially molten. It can be layered or there can be different morphologies. Now, for conventional volcanoes like Pinatubo, we know that there was an, an injection of magma from below. So magma was injected into the magma chamber from below, and this caused an overpressure in the magma chamber that started the eruption. Basically, if you inflate the balloon, if you inflate it enough, the balloon will burst. Now, the problem if you have a super volcano, this mechanism doesn't work, because the balloon is very big. And it's also very floppy, because the area around it is very hot. So the rock just deforms. So you can add more and more and more and more material and you will never have a lot of overpressure to start an eruption. Now, one mechanism that could trigger an eruption is to have the overpressure due to the density difference. The melt is less dense than the rock around it, so it's pushed up. If you try to hold a football underwater, it's pushing up against your hand. If you try to hold a very big football underwater, it's going to push up a lot more. A lot more. So, this brings me to the reason why I'm here today, because I came to Grenoble to measure the density of the melt. So we need to know the density of the melts and the rocks around it. So this is the ESRF, it's the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. It's a few kilometers from here, maybe not even a few kilometers. Uh, it's almost in the city center of Grenoble. So you have a very large donut-shaped building which contains a particle accelerator. Electrons are going around very quickly around this building. And as the electrons are bent, they emit X-rays. So scientists from all over Europe and the world come to Grenoble to do their experiments. So there's about 50 experimental stations all along the ring. So if they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so if you go at three in the night, you will see some very tired scientists running around doing their experiments. 
So this is a schematic way of how we measure density. We basically use the absorption of X-rays to determine the density. It's the same principle as if you have a, if you have a broken hand, you go to the doctor, the doctor will take an X-ray picture. Your bones will stand out, they will have contrast because they are heavier than your flesh. So the, more, the heavier something is, the more dense, the more it absorbs X-rays. That's the general principle. Now, this is a very schematic view, but in reality, there's a lot of cables and wires and detectors, but um, yeah, it's manageable and it's actually not so difficult once you get it to work. So what we do is we put a very small piece of sample, one cubic millimeter, and we compress it to very high pressure and very high temperature. So 36,000 times the Earth's atmospheric pressure and up to almost 2,000 degrees Celsius. So by doing, having such a large pressure range, we can, so we compress it and we measure how much of the X-rays are absorbed. This is what is shown here. So we move the whole press through the X-ray beam and then when the X-ray beam goes through the sample, we get an increase in absorbance. And from the height of this increase, we get the density. So we do this for different pressures and temperatures and magma compositions and then we fit an equation to the data. Um, once we have this equation, we can now go back to our super volcanoes and we can actually predict the overpressure at the roof of the magma chamber. So what we're interested in is the pressure at the roof of the magma chamber and to see if this is enough to potentially start an eruption or not. Now, because we don't really know anything about these magma chambers, well, we know some things, but there is a lot we don't know. We don't model one scenario, but we, we vary different possible scenarios. So we have different depths, different thicknesses, different temperatures, and so on, different melt compositions. So, in this slide, we now show the overpressure at the roof of the magma chamber. Um, each point or cross or square represents one possible scenario. The important line here is at 10 megapascals. Anything above that line is potentially enough to break the rock on top and start an eruption. Anything below should be on the safe side. So what we see is that in order to have a lot of overpressure, you need a very thick magma chamber. Just like you have a thick football, a very big football, it will push more. The, the thicker the magma chamber, the more it pushes up. And what we also see is that for realistic thicknesses of seven to eight kilometers, a lot of these scenarios actually are, have the potential to start an eruption. So what this is saying is that if you have this magma chamber that is sitting there and over time it's growing and growing and growing, at some point it will just erupt because it's big enough. You don't need an earthquake, you don't need anything else. The eruption will just happen by itself. So the eruption in, in some way is inevitable as the system grows. Um, what I also modeled here is the, what we estimate is the overpressure at Yellowstone today. Um, Yellowstone has a thick magma chamber, we know that from observations, um, but it's mostly crystals. So there's only 10, 15% melt and the rest of that are crystals. And that's why the density is very high, relatively high, and there's not much buoyancy overpressure. So it would need more melt accumulation to become a potentially erupting volcano. So I want to leave you back with this image of Yellowstone because I want to stress again that these are very rare events. This is not something to worry about in our lifetime, but as a species, we will have to be ready for this at some point in the future. And um, we are a very, very long way to predicting these events. We have no idea what would occur before. And we are even much, much further away to try and engineer a solution that would mitigate some of the consequences. But this is really a long-term project. <laughs> Thank you.